My name is Joyce Murphy, and I have the honor of being the mistress of ceremonies this evening. I'm delighted to be here, and as an awardee of last year, I was very fortunate to be selected to win one of these awards last year, and as a result, was asked back this year to present all of you to the 2011 Education to Service awardees. So I'm delighted to be here to do that. As you all know, that the honor is presented to Boston State College graduates professors and administrators who have demonstrated outstanding contributions in the areas of education, public service, and private industry. And it truly solidifies the Boston State College legacy. Now, unfortunately, this evening, Chancellor Motley has five functions. They're all in this building, so that's the good news. So he can just be running up and down stairs and all around. But we wanted to get started and introduce him and have him give his remarks. So he won't be here for the entire celebration, but we'll be spotting him. He's hard, he's hard, to, he's hard to miss. I'm, I'm going to be here, here as long as I can. Okay. And we know he's hard to miss, so we'll see him when he comes back and forth. So I am delighted to share the podium with Chancellor Motley as we go back really um, right. several years, several years. And if memory serves me correctly, Chancellor, we first met when I was CEO at Kearney Hospital, right. and you were the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs right here at UMass Boston. And we would connect regularly, it seems each and almost every single night in Dorchester at some community event. And I can attest for those of you who don't know Chancellor Motley well that he is probably the best advocate for UMass Boston and the Dorchester community that there ever has been and ever will be. So. <laughs> so clearly, during the past several years, I watched Chancellor Motley rise to interim chancellor, vice president for business, marketing, and public affairs, and ultimately the chancellor of UMass Boston. And is he the best chancellor or what? Yeah. <laughs> so I left Kearney Hospital as CEO about six years ago to join UMass Medical School in Worcester. So I think it's quite ironic that we end up back here and now Chancellor Motley and I are back in the UMass family together, which is very exciting. So we've come full circle, but always back to Dorchester. So it's truly an honor to introduce to you this evening, Chancellor Keith Motley. Wow. <laughs> wow, I tell you what. Someone called my office and they said there's a buzz over in the campus center. And so I thought to myself, that's better than what could be in the campus center, <laughs> given all the construction that we're having on campus, and if you know what I mean. But I walked in this room, and it was just, if you've been here from the first time we attempted to do this event, you know what I'm talking about. Give yourselves a round, a round, a round of applause. It's amazing. It's amazing for me to have the opportunity to stand before you and look out at you to see how wonderful you all look, but grateful that you've taken time out of your night to be here with us. I hope you know that your university is on the move, and that university would not be what it is without all of our predecessor institutions, particularly tonight, the one that we celebrate, Boston State College, State College of Boston, teachers for all of that. There was so much happening in this room that, uh, you know, Dan, I think he is emceeing upstairs, one of your um, Boston State alum, you know, news person extraordinaire. And, and, and he had to run down here just to see what was up because we had to tell him. We couldn't tell him about this event because we wanted him to do that event upstairs. <laughs> because up there, we're, we're raising money for all the young people in the city who are in schools on their way up through the pipeline to come to your university. I hope you know that because of you, because of your legacy, because of your legacy of service, because of your legacy of teaching, that all that we've become we stand on your shoulders. I look around this room, I see so many friends. More importantly, I see mentors. I see people that have been in the trenches with us. I'm just trying to turn off this phone 
<laughs> because my daughters now know that if they text me, I get back to them. <laughs> and it was like moving around in my pocket like something fancy was going to happen. Because they can't text me tonight because I'm kind of excited. I'll get to them in between running back and forth. Joyce, thank you. The irony in all this is now I serve as chair of Carney Hospital. I never thought that I would have that opportunity to serve there in that capacity. We had a board meeting this morning, and let me just tell you, it was amazing because we're going to, in spite of what some folks think, that hospital is a jewel in our community. We're going to continue to do that, and this university stands with it as we move forward together. We stand with the city. I'm so honored to be someone who they call now DTD. That means dedicated to Dorchester. There's so many OFDs in this room. But let me just tell you something that I'm even prouder of, that this university, who was positioned to be in a wonderful place, we love Dorchester, but some people saw that as positioning us to be less than from the perspective of not having any reach beyond the wonderful community that many of you represent and grew up in and all that. But now we're Boston's public research university that has an unbelievable teacher's teaching soul. And that soul comes from many of you who have sat around this room, who were developed, whether it was on Huntington Avenue or downtown or wherever it was, but went out into the world and made such a tremendous difference. Those of you that even took our band and then turned it back in. <laughs> We're part of that legacy as well. So it's great to be with you as we mark our fifth annual Boston State College celebration in the fourth anniversary of our Education for Service Awards. See, in the beginning, we were just trying to get you here. <laughs> now the problem is, you're going to make me have to give up the ballroom on one more night because you're not going to fit in this room soon. Soon we won't be able to have this kind of conversation just here. And I'm looking forward to that day where I walk in here and all that revenue that we would generate from putting that ballroom out on a night like tonight, we will not have to worry about because you'll be upstairs and it wouldn't matter to me a lick because it's about getting you back to your universe. I'm so glad you've come on. I'm honored to be your chancellor at this time in our history. There are amazing things happening. There are things that we've been trying to do since 1974 and since 1964 that so many people tried to put wrenches in the middle to stop that are now moving forward. Programs on this campus like engineering that our science instructors, it's a shame that there wasn't a public option in this city. Now there'll be a public option for engineering. PhD programs that have been on hold for years, moving forward. As you came on this campus, I know it was difficult to get here, and I'm glad about that because it means that you can't find a parking space because everybody else wants to be here every day, and we love it. I love that you had to walk. I love that you get mud on your shoes. Mud on your shoes means that I am experienced with my colleague Peter and everyone else that are being honored tonight, and those who served in this role understand that I sit in my office with a construction with, a, with, with my erector set and my construction vehicles on the floor. That's why when they say, "Well, Chancellor, why do you always pick elementary schools to go to, and you love to run into kindergarten?" It's because it gives me my excuse and gets my legs ready for when I get back to campus and I get my little model of the buildings that are going up and I get my little trucks and I get my, all my construction vehicles and I'm sitting on my floor <laughs> thinking about the future of this institution because there shouldn't be anyone in this room that's satisfied with anyone trying to categorize us as less than, less faculty, less premier faculty, less wonderful people, less buildings that matter for our students, our faculty, and for all of you. I envision one day you're coming on this campus, and everywhere you look, you'll say, hey, why is that campus center such a messed up looking building? <laughs> because nothing that we do will be the same as it was before coming back here. 
although I came home. I did not come back to the same university that I left for two years. I came back like a stream. You step in that stream, but it could be that same place you remember as a little boy fishing. But you're pulling out those fish, and it's still not the same water, but it's, you, you have such an unbelievable space in your heart for that place. That's why I came home, and that's why you're coming home tonight. Because you remember that although it may not be on Huntington Avenue, and although it may not be that, and although when you look in the mirror, I know I still think I'm 17. <laughs> I still see myself with my afro. <laughs> my teacher's over there. I used to wear it into class when she was teaching me as a freshman in college. Now I'm, I'm looking in the mirror, I think it's still there. <laughs> my kids tease me, they smack me on the top of my head. They remind me, they say, you might be one of the 50, 50 most influential people in Boston, but when you get to Stoughton, mm, <laughs> you're just that, you're hey you, you're here's my list, <laughs> and you take the garbage out on Mondays before 8 o'clock. That's who you are. But I am so proud to be your chance. Tonight, we have the opportunity to build on this tradition, this tradition of excellence that many of you in this room started. Do not take that legacy for granted. Do not sit here thinking that you don't have an honored space in our history. What your right is, is to take your place in that space. When you sit on the sideline, you can't find your way to that space unless you step up like you're stepping up tonight. And all it takes is just coming in the room. No one's going to say, where you been? No one's going to say, why haven't you? All people are going to say to you is, thank you. Because your presence matters. Don't you know that you inspire the deepest parts of our souls and the deepest parts of our thinking when you show up? because it reminds us of what our responsibility is. So many people go to our students and they say, that's what is the, the key to that. The key to it for me is that I know my responsibility is to them, but it's to you to carry on that legacy. That's what keeps me on the straight and narrow. Because when I see you, I know I have to answer to your legacy. And my answer is, that we're going to work hard every day, and yes, we'll make some mistakes. Because if we don't try things that are beyond what some people think of us, we'll never achieve the greatness that you expect from us. And so, I know I wasn't supposed to do a keynote. <laughs> but I'm what you know, you got me in front of all these folks. You tried to give me some limiting notes. Just say this, say that, welcome this person, talk about some chairman, do that, and this and the other. But no, it's, it's, it's not, it, this is not that situation. Tonight is a situation for celebration. Yes, I'm going to welcome to the chairman of the Quincy College Board of Governors, William Bradley. Where are you at? Where's William? Is he here tonight? Okay, we'll see. <laughs> and all his other colleagues on the board. Because one of my dear friends in this business is being honored tonight. He's a gentleman. Peter is, is being honored tonight. And I'm so glad that Peter Safaris is being honored. President of Quincy College. Our colleagues up the street. But also, more importantly, uh, someone who we just um, revere here on this campus. I also like to acknowledge the family and friends of other award winners that are here tonight. Our man, Jerry Burke. Yeah. You know, he's got a whole crew. He travels real deep. Former President Beverly Lowry, thank you for being here. And then we doubled up on you. Joan and John Moon. Yes. Yeah. We threw a curveball over there. You just thought you were coming back, just hanging around, keep, you know, we this and that. Well, guess what? 
We understand, and we're so grateful. It matters. Don't you ever let anyone ever tell you that it doesn't. Every day, those pieces of paper that I was given sit up on my shelf where I can see them. And it talks about what you felt like when this transition happened. So we don't take that lightly. Our goal is to make sure that you understand that it's us. And us beats all of that. And as we go forward together, it's an amazing feeling to walk around this town now representing you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, there's no more back of the you know, room when you come to a meeting. There's no more, I hope they mention me in our university. There's no more students who you go into the classroom and they all got on Boston College shirts. <laughs> and I'm a BC graduate, you know, because that's where they're telling me they want to go. And I'm like, oh, well, this is the wrong day. That's when father comes. <laughs> you know, I'm at the university, man. If you walk in now, you don't have to correct that stuff. Just walk in and you just say, hmm, they're following you. Look behind you, there's a line. And that's because of you. So to our wonderful award winners tonight, to the committee, to those of you that have continued this legacy, and to those of you that took that first step, then you told somebody, because I'm, you know, I'm an honest kind of guy. I remember when some of us just didn't want to come in the room. But now you're here. So we can wipe all that stuff out. Go get the rest of it. There are multitudes of people who need the opportunity to come back home. I'm going to find them. I hope you tell them that when I do find them, this size 16 is going to be kicking them right towards this way. <laughs> so know that everything you do lives in the classrooms of these campuses, of this campus, in our colleges, whether it's the College of Nursing, Education, wherever it is on this campus, management, now, on a daily basis, I'm fortunate enough to have the wisdom council of, you know, when it came for me to decide who I wanted around me, to tell me what I need to be thinking or to balance me so that I'm not going off on some tangents, I went to your legacy to find that. Our provost is one of you. Um, Ms. Delaney. And when I'm not around, there's somebody who um, looks just, she's like my twin. She represents me. Um, and where is Terry Mortimer at? Right here in the my associate. And so she and Winston are on both shoulders, making sure that I'm balanced about my thinking that I never forget what these institutions are about. And so, thank you. Recipients, like the ones we honor this evening, truly embody your motto, education for service. I want to congratulate all of you for taking the step. And as many of you know firsthand, when you look at the back of the program, tonight, we want to evoke the memory of Professor Carol Rimmer, who we lost in October. She was deeply dedicated to supporting students. Every time she saw me, she smacked me around about students. At Boston State, she taught English to future, future educators. Here at this university, she brought that same commitment to student success to the undergraduates she taught and the participants that she put out into cooperative education. See, Northeastern doesn't have the only cooperative education program in the world. They just happen to have a private one. Because the public one that's been happening, because these young people and others have had to work for years in their disciplines while they were going to school. And the reason they're so talented is because you know all the statistical data says that when you have to work and you go to school, and if you work in proximity to that institution that you are in, your scholarship goes up 
and up and up. Your experiences go up and up. Your commitment, and because 80% plus stay here, their commitment to this commonwealth goes up. So that's why the governor follows me around. <laughs> you know? Because he understands that everybody else is just coming and going. You all are here. And if I have to call you, that's a voice. Or if I have to call recent graduates, that's a voice. And so, thank you. So I'm going to get out your way. <laughs> I think that's all I was supposed to say. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, 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 I'm supposed to say, I'm supposed to thank you for contributing to the fund. <laughs> and I can, I'm supposed to tell you that it's not over. You can keep contributing. <laughs> but I'm also supposed to, say to, supposed to say to the 50th class that the 51st class can show you all a little thing or two about how that works, too. But to the 50th class, we got some things we're going to do, and we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to show that 25th class how to make it happen. We honor our 50th class and our 25th class at commencement. And this year's commencement, we can't announce it yet. It's going to be unbelievable because we had a well-recognized person who was going to be leading our commencement along with the provost and I and our faculty as we go forward. So thank you for being here tonight, helping us honor Boston State. Stop by the room and get a few smiles and laughs as you go through and see some of the folks that meant a lot to you along the way, and many of you are there as well. Know that this proud legacy started at 625 Huntington Ave. But it keeps on going out on the most beautiful campus in the world. Come on back up. It says, take water as you leave the state. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor. We can always rely on Keith to have a great welcome and a great presentation, so we appreciate that. And now on to the awards. So to a fellow graduate of Boston State College, Peter Safaris, class of 1973. For nearly four decades, you have served the people of the Commonwealth of Mass as an exemplary leader in public higher education. In a career path that has taken you from posts in the state college system to roles in campus administration at Boston State College and Bridgewater State College. You have honed an expertise in human resources and labor relations and use your exceptional talent to further the critical role they play in supporting education. Today, as president of Quincy College, you oversee a two-year institution of higher education with three different locations, an enrollment of 4,600 students, and a budget of $25.5 million. Your focus is on the quality of teaching and learning, and you have made responding to the concerns of students and faculty a top priority. And the changes you have made this past year to improve working conditions, upgrade facilities, and improve student services, we see the foundation for the college's promising future. As an educator at Massasoit Community College in their certificate program in human resources, you use your specialized knowledge to prepare professionals for this critical area of business management. In your many professional positions as executive, education executive, policymaker, teacher, and lawyer, you have applied exceptional skill and leadership talent to benefit others. Through your outstanding contributions in the field of public higher education, you personify Boston State College's education for service motto and serve as an exemplar of the college's legacy. In recognition, in recognition of your distinguished service and leadership, the University of Mass Boston is proud to present you with the Boston State College Education for Service. Peter, please step up. Thank you. You have to say one thing about Boston State people. They really know how to throw a party, right? I was told they have two minutes. I don't think that's going to happen, but. 
First of all, we have a ton of Quincy people here. I thought when I received notification that I was going to get this award, there'd be about eight people here, <laughs> two of whom would be to see me, and uh, everybody else would have a huge crowd. So uh, all the, my, most of my board is here, and a lot of people right. with whom I have worked are, I am working presently. So I'd just like uh, a round of applause for the Quincy people, oh, just yeah. so people know you're here. Thank you. In my time in public higher education, and uh, because we share some mutual acquaintances, I've really had an opportunity to observe Chancellor Motley's career at the University of Massachusetts. And I think for those of you who have been here for a few years, read the alumni magazines or have an opportunity to come to the campus, you cannot help but be impressed with what is going on here. And could there ever be a better person right now to lead this university? Really? Also, I'd like to say that I'm really humbled to be in the company of the other awardees this evening. I've known uh, Dr. Moon uh, since the early 80s. I've known Dr. Burke during his entire presidency, and I'm proud to say he's a friend and acquaintance of mine. And although I haven't had an opportunity to meet the other recipients much before this evening. I'm really proud to be in their company, and I think they deserve a round of applause. So what can you say about Boston State? I went to Boston State in 1972 and 1973. The world and the community in which Boston State found itself was very different in 1972 and 1973 than the world we find ourselves in today. But what always struck me, although the facilities were a little worn, not run down, but worn, <laughs> although the windows were open in the middle of the winter because it was so hot you could wear your shorts, <laughs> and although sometimes the lighting wasn't always the best, I always had a sense of excitement when I got off the tee and walked past the wrought iron gates and went into um, the campus. And I think that sense of excitement was pervasive, at least it was for me, um, during my entire period there. I also had the great opportunity in 1979, 80, and 81 to work as assistant to the president, who was then uh, Bob McCarthy, Dr. Robert McCarthy, at Boston State. And I found that same excitement at that point in time. So my memories of Boston State um, although I can't remember every classroom I was in, I can remember very fondly, uh, fondly I should say, don't use two adverbs, I get scolded. Uh, <laughs> I can remember fondly my time at Boston State. And you know, what struck me was, although there were a lot of divisions in society at that time, not unlike we have today, but in a different way, uh, you could, you know, an off-duty Boston cop wearing a windbreaker over his un full uniform and uh, a middle school teacher from the Boston Public School Department, and myself and someone who was uh, in the SDS and working a midnight shift in a factory so they could overthrow society, um, could all sit together and, and, and uh, so everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> the truth is stranger than fiction all the time. Um, but we could all find common ground and, and speak with each other about um, issues of importance to us. And I think, I think I felt, and I think that, I always get emotional when I get passionate, but I think that I felt, and I think that the people that I was with felt, that we were really fortunate to go to Boston State. I think that I felt, and I believe that the people that I went to school with felt that we all had a duty to make society, whether it be in our families or our community, um, a better place than it was. And I, and I firmly believe that we all believe that Boston State would give us the opportunity to do that. And I think that's the secret of Boston State College. So while I accept this award tonight, uh, I accept it emblematic of uh, th literally thousands of other people who um, worked hard and are successful in their own way today 
as a result of their time at Boston State. And uh, I think that's the greatest uh, tribute that I can give to this institution, whether it be on Huntington Avenue or as a successor institution. So thank you. I always have one way of figuring out whether someone actually went to Boston State. After standing at the corner of Longwood Ave and Huntington, <laughs> waiting for the, the green line to come down, which then came all the way from the Arbor Way, and feeling the wind come down from Brigham Circle as you're waiting there, I firmly believe it's etched in my mind that that's one of the coldest spots in North America. <laughs> And if you tell that to people and they just smile and look at you knowingly, you know they went to Boston State. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. To a fellow Boston State alumna, Beverly Lowry, class of 75, the seeds of your ambition to become a teacher were planted as a young girl driving by Teachers College. You aspired to someday study within its walls, and eventually you did, beginning at the age of 39. In a distinguished career in public education, you have brought your knowledge, professional skills, and tremendous passion to developing the potential of a most vulnerable population, students with special needs. From your early career as a Boston Public Schools teacher, through your later years in Westwood and Canton schools, you sought to ensure that these children engaged with an appropriate curriculum and learning environment to foster their academic and social skills. To the young girl with an intellectual disability, the worried mother with an autistic son, and the new teacher in an inclusive classroom setting, you provided reassurance and support. Through mentoring students, student teachers and lecturing in Curry College's evening division, you help prepare a new generation of professionals in your field. Outside the classroom, you are a labor union advocate, using your leadership talent to serve the Norfolk County Teachers Association as a two-term president. As an educator and activist, I don't think he was talking about you, though, actually, the SDS. <laughs> you earned the esteemed recognition of these public education colleagues who chose you to be Canton's Teacher of the Year and most recently awarded you the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award, only the second time that they have bestowed this honor. Today, in retirement, you continue your commitment to public education as a volunteer advocate for special needs children and as a member of the executive board of the Norfolk County Teachers Association, where you represent retired teachers. Through your outstanding contributions in the fields of special education and labor union advocacy, you personify Boston State College's education for service motto and serve as an exemplar of the college's legacy. In recognition of your distinguished service and leadership, the University of Massachusetts Boston is proud to present you with the Boston State College Education for Service Award. Beverly, please step up and receive the award. Don't go too far with that name tag. I have to remember who I am this evening. We'll remind you. Okay. Needless to say, I'm delighted to be here this evening. Many years ago did I ever think that tonight would come. Because as a young girl in Roxbury, I used to walk by, it was Teachers College then, and I thought, oh, how I would love to go there. But financially, it wasn't possible. And I kept talking about it at home, and my mother said, you shouldn't be a teacher, because in those days, teachers didn't marry. <laughs> and she thought the ultimate goal was to marry and have a family. Years later, she said to me, why didn't you do this a long time ago? <laughs> you know, I said, Mom, we don't go there. <laughs> but uh, I'm delighted to be here this evening, and I am very proud to accept this award. And like I said, my dream was to become a teacher. When I went to first grade, I came home and I said, I'm going to be a teacher. But nobody listened. <laughs> 
And I went through school and I never gave up that idea. But like I said, it wasn't financially possible when I graduated high school. But up until that time, I had spent many, many years working with children. At that point, they weren't special needs, but that was something that developed later. But I was very, very fortunate. I was able to go to Boston Clerical, and I graduated. And that's that old school where you had to get all A's to graduate. If you got an 89, you took the course over again. So when you graduated there, you could get a job just about anywhere. But of course, the job I wanted was teaching. But I did work for the Navy for a while. And then I was at a church here in Jamaica Plain. And there was a Sunday school superintendent named Booker Devon. And Booker and I became very friendly. And I give him much of the credit of my being here today because I did tutoring in Roxbury and Jamaica Plain, and he said to me, you've got to go to school to become a teacher. Well, he, he was relentless. He wouldn't <laughs> give up on me. So he brought the application, and my husband said, I don't know. You know, you, you have the education that you want. I said, oh, no, I don't. <laughs> and he, Booker would not give up. So I filled out the application. Next thing I knew, a group that I was in, in uh, said, we're offering you a scholarship so you go back to school and do what you want. Well, by then I had two children and a husband. So I said, how am I going to do it in a part-time job? Well, this was my dream. So I said, I'm going to go there over on Huntington Ave. Well, as I walked through the courtyard, believe me sincerely, I would look up to the skies and say, thank you, God, I have arrived, I am here. <laughs> and um, I love the city. We did move out to the suburbs, but I miss the city terribly. But I'm gonna tell you, when I left my driveway and I got in that car, and headed over the parkway, I was very happy. And then I discovered that I guess I was a forever student. I started and I got the bachelor's and there was no question, I had to move on. So I was one of the lucky ones, I got a job. I wanted to teach in the inner city but there weren't that many jobs then. So I, student taught in the town in which I live is Westwood and I was one of the lucky ones, I got a job. And I was there for five years, and I worked with special needs. I always worked with special needs. I had volunteered at our high school, and I worked with a miracle woman. And I said, that's what I want to do. So I worked with the little ones in Westwood. Then I had a golden opportunity with an offer in Canton. Westwood was okay, but I loved Canton. And I taught there for a few years, and then I became a diagnostician, and I went into administration. But you know what? That's when my going to Boston Clerical paid off. <laughs> because I had a lot of paperwork. And I didn't have to pay anybody to type. And I didn't have to wait in line for the secretary to do it. So that's what I did. And I think that was my niche. I love teaching, and I had the opportunity, as they mentioned, as Joyce mentioned, to teach at Curry College, which was another thrilling experience. I could still teach, but I could also use those other skills in administration, which I loved. Well, I had a lot of support. Like I said, I had the family, I had the kids, and a part-time job, because you always need that when you come to Boston State, you know. <laughs> so I was very, very fortunate in that at that point, my mother thought to be a teacher was the thing to do. <laughs> so I, I'll never forget when I brought the first report card home. My husband said, oh, next time you might get the president's list. I said, I got news for this guy. So from then on, I was on the president's list. Because
because I loved what I did. And I had many opportunities over the years. Uh, I could really feel I could have written a book on a day in special ed. Most of the parents were wonderful, but the ones that weren't were a big challenge, and I liked the challenge. So after 26 years, I retired. And I didn't know how that was going to be. But unfortunately, at that time, I lost my husband to a rare form of cancer, so we really didn't have a retirement. But they say, be busy, and that's, that's a great help when you lose someone dear to you. So I became an advocate, and I volunteer my services as an advocate for special needs children. And I provide the support for the students, their parents, because I've been on both sides of the desk. And maybe I did gravitate towards special ed because I have a son with dyslexia. <coughs> and the dyslexic students have a tough time. But there is a, so many different areas of special needs that the kids really need a lot of support. So I loved that work. I've done advocacy here in the Boston area, the South Shore, and I even went to Rhode Island. But let me tell you, Massachusetts does a lot more for their kids. And of course, we have the, the double law. But I have loved doing what I did. I even coped with the paperwork. But I am very much honored tonight and thrilled to be here. I cannot help but mention, I had many excellent professors at Boston State, but two that really stood out was Dr. Cook, who taught psychology, and Dr. Cristiani was my other favorite. And those were wonderful years. I would say they were among the best of my life. And I am very grateful for all those that helped me along this journey to find my dream. It took me a while, but you're never too old to learn. And I thank each one of you for being here. Well, see, we've only, we've only met two of the uh, awardees tonight, and we can certainly see that the selection committee did an outstanding job in terms of what you all epitomize for education for service. So now, to a proud State Teacher College, State Teachers College at Bo a Boston alumnus, and former member of the Boston State College faculty, Dr. Jerry Burke. <laughs> Boston Public High School's high school teacher, history professor, Massasoit Community College president, Brockton School committee member, Plymouth County Commissioner, Senior Lecturer in Modern Irish History at UMass Boston. These are just some of the many positions that you have held in a most distinguished career as a public education leader and in your active life of voluntary service. Whether in the classroom or in the executive corner office, you believe that every student has the potential to succeed and you have committed yourself to providing them with the resources to do so. For you, Dedication to improving the lives of others is much more than a professional responsibility. It is a way of life that has inspired your involvement with organizations like the Old Colony Catholic Charities, the United Way, and Plymouth County Hospital, among others. It is a mission that you embraced in your many years as a foster parent, along with your wife, Rosemary, to 35 newborn babies. A graduate of State Teachers College at Boston, former Boston State College faculty member, you have credited our alma mater as the place where you, a self-described working class kid from Boston, got the foundation for everything you have achieved professionally in your life. And for all that you have done to build on that education, we look to you with great admiration. Through your outstanding contributions in the field of public higher education and as a community leader, you personify Boston State College's education for service motto and serve as an exemplar of the college's legacy. 
In recognition of your distinguished service and leadership, the University of Mass at Boston is proud to present you with the Boston State College Education for Service Award. Thank you. Professor Motley, who's doing an absolutely outstanding job, uh, previous uh, recipients of the uh, award and my uh, fellow honorees tonight. Uh, I'd like to say how honored and pleased I am when I was told that I had two minutes. <laughs> I said, to tell any Irishman he has two minutes to speak, <laughs> especially one who gives three hour lectures, it comes under the category of cruel and un yeah. unflattering. Yeah. That's it's, like, it's like asking uh, Keith Motley to say yeah. a couple of words. I mean, <laughs> it's not gonna happen, you know? But, uh, uh, I'd like, first of all, just to acknowledge uh, a couple of members of my family are here. My wife, Rosemary, sort of the uh, wind beneath my wing for 52 years. <laughs> my son, Gerard, and my... My daughter, Joanna, and husband, Bill Camilla, both teach in Brockton. And my niece, Mary Burke, who's uh, administrator and teacher at the uh, Quincy College. Yes. You know, now that I've reached the uh, three-quarter century mark, I guess my life could be looked at as history. I'm sure the students would think it was ancient history. <laughs> Most of them think history began sometime in 1990. But, uh, so I want to tell a little bit of history. My father was born and raised in South Boston, and he was one of 10. And he went to English high school, which at the time, Boston Latin and Boston English were the two best high schools in New England. And in his junior year, his father passed away. And so he had to withdraw without getting a, a diploma. But I never heard my father once complain about the hand that had been dealt him. He had to go to work to support his mother and his uh, siblings. And uh, he was a very proud individual. And my father was a, uh, a building custodian. And we grew up in a three-decker in Mattapan section of Dorchester. Uh, nine of us in, in that apartment with one bathroom, if you can imagine that. <laughs> but we had a great family life. My father and mother gave us a great uh, uh, moral compass and a good uh, work ethic, which I think has uh, stood us in good stead ever since. Uh, my father sent every one of us uh, to parochial grammar and high school. And you can only imagine the sacrifices that they must have had made uh, at that time. But uh, I can remember vividly uh, my eighth grade class at uh, Our Lady of Lords uh, Grammar School in Jamaica Plain. And Sister Amada gave us an essay to write on what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I wrote an essay on being a history teacher. And here I am 60 years later, and I'm still t teaching history. So uh, something that I love to do. And I'm certainly a very proud uh, a graduate of uh, the class of 1959 from Teachers College. A whole gaggle of my <laughs> over there. You know? President Teddy Roosevelt once said that far and away the best prize that life has to offer is to work hard at work that's worth doing. And I have had the privilege uh, for over 45 years to play a role, however small, in the lives of young men and women, and some not so young, uh, providing them with the opportunity for a better and more fulfilling life. And it really has been an absolute uh, privilege for me to do that. And to quote one of my favorite uh, philosophers, Emma Baumbach, <laughs> said, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I hope I don't have one single little bit of talent left. And I can say, I used everything you gave me. Thanks for the award, God bless. have to remember that saying. That's a great one. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So to former members of the Boston State College faculty, Professors Joan and John Moon, 
Over a combined tenure of 42 years, you served on the faculty of our beloved alma mater, Boston State College. And in the larger arena of higher education, you have been remarkable advocates in promoting the core values of academic freedom, shared governance, and the advancements of fundamental professional standards for higher education. At Boston State, Joan imparted her passion for Chaucer to undergraduates in her English classes, while John <coughs> brought history to life for future teachers and aspiring professionals. As you honed your students' skills in thinking and writing, you also fell in love and married, proving once again that Boston State was certainly a great place to meet your mate. <laughs> <laughs> Known for your commitment to high standards and your dedication to your students, you also served as faculty leaders in public higher education at the campus level and in the state chapters of your professional associations. Joan helped to draft the Constitution for the Boston State College Faculty Senate, served on the Executive Council of the Massachusetts State Chapter of the American Association of University Professors, and chaired the Association State Committee on the Status of Women. During her tenure as a faculty member here at UMass Boston's College of Management, she led the Faculty Steering Committee, Curriculum Committee, and chaired the Analysis and Communication Department. In her honor, her colleagues established the Joan Moon Teaching Excellence Award upon her retirement. A vocal activist and highly skilled leader, John organized the American Association of University Professors chapter at Boston State. He served in leadership capacities, including president at the Massachusetts State College Association and was a two-term president of the Massachusetts Conference of the American Association of University Professors. As president of the Teachers Union at the time of Boston State College's discontinuance, John led the union effort to oppose it and later worked diligently to help place his colleagues at other public higher educational institutions in Massachusetts. In 1990, he chaired a committee which produced an important study by the Council of Presidents of the Massachusetts State College System, which was designed to defend the colleges against future attempts to weaken them. Following his tenure at Boston State, John joined the faculty at Fitchburg State in the Social Science Department. As a scholar, he specialized in US military history and published extensively in the fields of chemical and biological weapons. Joan and John, your outstanding professional achievements have ensured higher education's contributions to the common good. Together, you personify Boston State College's education for service motto and serve as exemplars of the college's legacy. In recognition of your distinguished service and leadership, the University of Massachusetts Boston is proud to present you with the Boston State College Education for Service Award. John and Joan, can you join us up here? My husband and I thank all of you who came here tonight to remember Boston State College and its ongoing mission here at UMass, education for service. <clears throat> for a teacher retired for years now, it is a rather stunning experience to face the music again, <laughs> to stand before my former students one more time, to tell you how much this recognition, this award, means to me and my husband, John, who defines in his everyday life the very concept of public service. <clears throat> In 1964, I came to Boston to teach in the public sector for the first time, to work with students who were not coddled, as I put it to myself. The students who were facing me that year, for some of you here tonight, your younger selves, you upended many of my assumptions about how things worked, a case of the teacher being taught. For instance, much to my surprise, many of you worked to fund your own education, books, fees, transportation. Yet you managed to finish the course, do the reading, write the papers, 
and do it well. I had also assumed I would help to shape your world. I would share my love of literature with you, introduce you to the wonders of how language works. You would grow intellectually and emotionally. Unexpectedly, I found myself growing with you, learning, seeing the world from different angles through your eyes. Later in that decade and the next, I was surprised by the number of older faces looking up at me. I found myself in the College of Second Chances. I was impressed by the enthusiasm, the gravitas, and the courage of so many of you deciding at a later age that an education was worth fighting for. I had not anticipated such determination to get it right in a freshman comp course. And then came the moral struggles precipitated by the Vietnam War. Our male students faced with life and death choices had to act in the face of situations that confounded many of their elders. Watching and listening to the spiritual anguish you endured, I found deeply humbling. Who of us had been prepared for this? Certainly not me. It was quite a learning experience. I thank you for coming and for your support of the Boston State College Scholarship Fund, our door to the future of education for service. Teaching is a public service. Thank you. Forty years ago, Joan, a woman whose bravery is as great as her gentleness, did me the honor of becoming my wife. Aww. Throughout our marriage, we have worked as a team. I seek her advice on all my decisions. She reads everything I write before I submit it for publication. <laughs> she even helps me to read proof. No greater love has a woman. <laughs> How appropriate that you should honor us jointly. Since the legislature dissolved Boston State College as an independent institution, all of us have created new lives. Mine has been largely as a writer. At first, I wrote on American strategy in the Second World War. Then I turned my attention to weapons of mass destruction, especially chemical and biological weapons. My work is largely a meditation on international violence, how it is justified and how to limit its destructive force. I have also felt compelled to answer calls to public service and to join with a largely anonymous army fighting for causes I treasure, among them chemical and biological warfare disarmament and a repudiation of torture. The chemical, <laughs> the chemical Weapons Convention is a landmark treaty banning the production, stockpiling, possession, transfer, and use of chemical weapons. In the ratification process, I worked with other academics, with Senator Kerry's office, and with the Henry L. Stimson Center in Washington. The treaty ratified in 1997 is now being successfully uh, implemented. The US and Russia, the largest possessors, are actively destroying their stockpiles. Another challenge followed swiftly. Shortly after 9-11, Vice President Cheney declared, we have to work with the dark side. The consequences of that decision turned legitimate concerns with national security into an extension of government power that threatens the civil liberties of the, the United States was founded on, especially the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments of the United States Constitution. Torture is not only illegal in customary international and federal law, 
it is also immoral and un-American. In Lincoln's phrase, it violates the better angels of our nature. And yes, waterboarding, a gift from the Spanish Inquisition, is torture. Officially sanctioned torture practices used by the United States have ceased, but the precedence has been set and no one can be, has been held accountable. I joined the many others who felt as I did. We marched in, at, in downtown Boston to close Guantanamo. We spoke against torture and warrantless surveillance at packed uh, public meetings, one of them chaired by Representative Markey in Faneuil Hall. None of these events were reported by the Boston Globe or the major news stations. Public service often remains anonymous. In the causes I have publicly supported, I have held to the conviction that to stay silent when confronted with an obvious wrong is to help to enable that wrong. As a public servant, as a public servant, I have tried to live that belief. It is impossible to know what impact one voice carries or what the outcome will be. The endeavor, win or lose, carries its own worth. Thank you very much. close the formal part of our award ceremony and I'd like to thank all of you for being here this evening and I, I know you'll all agree that we had five outstanding awardees this evening that truly truly have had remarkable contributions to service. Now the most the most important announcement of the night for me is that the bar is open till nine and there's food there's all kinds of food and the bar is open and if I could ask the five awardees to come up here, we're going to take some pictures of the group. And those of you who have your plaques up here, don't forget those as well. So, <clears throat> please. And as you're coming for the photograph, I want to, in honor of her work this evening and before, present to present to Joyce. <laughs> 